Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Everyday Matters, a Contemporary Approaches to Architecture, edited by Vanessa Grossman and Ciro Miguel and published by Ruby Press. Caitlin De Silvi wrote, This happened, read the brief email message from my husband. I clicked on the attachment and saw our front porch collapsed onto the path outside our home surrounded by a scatter of broken slates and splintered wood. A slow, mostly invisible process of decay had reached its conclusion. The 125-year-old iron bolts had gradually oxidized. Moisture had collected on the backsides of the wooden supports against the damp granite. Together, rot and rust worked away at their chemical and organic labors. When it came, the failure was sudden and severe. The happening is the breach in the everyday, the swerve in which ordinary architecture is exposed in its vulnerability, belly up, like a dead horse. So, the story begins here, on the front path of a terraced granite cottage in a village in Cornwall, in the far southwest of England, in October 2019. But what happened next? This essay shares the rest of the tale, which is notably less dramatic and vivid than the initial event. As with most narratives of maintenance and repair, it is composed of a series of minor decisions, delays and deliberations. It unfolds in stuttering stages, leaps forward and long pauses. It ties in with other stories and other lives. It reveals, I will suggest, something about complicity. Beyond its most common definition, which implies some form of guilt by association, complicity is also defined more broadly as a state of being complex or involved. Maintenance is not commonly understood as a particularly complex or involved practice. Things break and wear, we fix them. But, as other contributions in this book show, the process is never that simple. Maintenance always involves choices about methods, materials, makers, and these choices are hitched indelibly to other subjectivities and other geographies. In this essay, I narrate this involvement and complexity to see where it leads us. The details, though they may seem banal and insignificant, are necessary, so bear with me. Our porch collapse coincides with the sudden unemployment of a friend. He is casting around for work and comes over to take a look at our problem. We live in the middle of a row of three once identical Victorian cottages built by the village doctor to house his office, his own home and the home of his elderly mother. The local museum has a photograph taken about a decade after construction that shows the trio with their matching porches and bay windows marching down the hill. Over the years, the cottages have been altered to meet the tastes and needs of their subsequent owners, but the porches remained original and intact until a few years ago, when the neighbors on the downhill side decided to partly enclose their porch with side panels to keep out the prevailing westerlies. The break in the unity of the row is noticeable, and our recent collapse has broken the pattern completely. We decide, in conversation with our friend, that he will try to replicate the original design as faithfully as possible. He thinks he can probably salvage the carved diagonal supports and build them into a new frame. He quotes us a reasonable price for the job and comes around with his father-in-law's pickup truck to haul the carcass back to his workshop. He sends us an update a week later, reporting that the work is going well and that he has sourced a stock of cheap modern slate from a supplier in a nearby village. The next couple months are very wet. Our porchless door leaks rain onto the granite seal with every storm. We see our friend around and ask about his progress. He gestures at the sky. He explains that he needs a run of dry weather to set the epoxy on the new bolts that will anchor the structure onto the stone wall. We receive an email on January 20 with the subject line, high pressure. He hangs the rebuilt frame the next week, 
sitting it onto the steel bolts and delivers a stack of grayish green slate tiles, their texture smooth and even. We have a chat about the slate installation and the friend realizes that he hasn't calculated for an overhang on either side of the pitch. He makes up the difference by increasing the gap between each slate, nailing them onto the cladding boards quickly as dusk closes in on a January afternoon. In the light of the next morning, I notice that the line of the slate on the bottom of the pitch is off, hanging lower by an inch or two on one side. I wonder if I should say anything and decide to send an email asking if he could reset them. He replies, I did it by Cornish eye, not level, should have checked what it looked like from your side, not just the roadside, and he offers to fix it. But the rain comes again and it doesn't stop until March. We will later learn that February 2020 was England's wettest February on record since 1862. On March the 16th the sun breaks through the clouds and our friend appears out front with a ladder. He removes the slates and stacks the unbroken ones on the front yard. That evening, Boris Johnson tells us to avoid all non-essential social contact and to work from home if possible. Lockdown officially begins a week later. The friend says that he needs a few more slates to finish the job and replace the broken ones, but in the first few weeks of lockdown the slate supplier isn't trading. When things start to open up again in late April, the friend says he's waiting for a rainy day to make the trip to collect what he needs. The rainy day doesn't come. The sun shines and shines, and the exposed cladding boards begin to warp and split. May 2020 ranks as the driest May on record for England. In the middle of the month, a roofer begins work on our next door neighbor's bay window. The slates he uses are smaller and more varied in texture than the ones stacked on our front yard. The roofer sets the tiles on a lime mortar onto wooden buttons, his skill and care evident. I chat with him about what he is doing and about our slate-less porch. In an attempt to restart our stalled job, I send a message to the friend offering to buy the slates he needs myself if he can find time to finish the work. He accepts the offer and suggests that if he can't get to it, maybe the roofer, whom he knows, can do the work as a favor to him since he's already essentially on site. I correspond with a local supplier, sending him photos of the new slates so he can match them. He replies, I believe they are 400 by 200 mm Brazilian grey-green slate. The roofer says that he has an account with the supplier and that he can source what's needed, but he seems reluctant to commit to the job. Eventually it becomes clear that he would prefer not to use the Brazilian slates. He offers to use reclaimed Cornish slate instead, like the ones he used next door. He gives me a quote for the work and I accept it. He texts back, I will be happy to lay Cornish slate on your porch, more appropriate for the village and a more durable job. He explains that he will be using slate tiles salvaged from the roof of a farmhouse on the other side of the river, which he has sorted and cleaned. He does the job over two days in early June, leaving the final priming and painting to me. I ask if he wants to take the unused Brazilian slates for another job, and he says he would rather not. He doesn't like working with them because they tend to shatter when they are cut rather than cleave as ordinary slates do. A week or so later, in the middle of June, on my way into my writing studio in the nearby town, I notice a pallet of slate tiles sitting outside the back door in the rain. The plastic label on the pallet says Made in Brazil, and the slates resemble those left behind in my front yard. The granite building that houses my studio is a former school, built in three stages between 1897 and 1913, and the roof is a rambling range of pitches and slopes, all clad in the original Cornish slate, now fragile and failing in places. 
The next day, I have a chat with the man who is doing the roofing work. He prefers Spanish slate, he explains, but the Brazilian ones are cheap, at around 40 pence a tile. Spanish slate is at least 20 pence more, hard to afford on a big job. I ask him about using Cornish slate and he raises his eyebrows. Too dear, and there is a waiting list. He implies that the Cornish slate industry, based 50 miles away in Delabol, now focuses on high-end clients. I ask what will happen with the old tiles and he says that they will likely get crushed and used as fill. A lot of them are knackered, he explains, and break when you pull the nails used to fasten them. He's been asked to set aside the undamaged tiles for reuse on one of the outbuildings and a small stack is building up on the scaffolding. He speculates that the original slate could have come from De La Bole, or maybe from Wales. It looks very similar to the reclaimed slate just installed on our porch roof. I take a photograph of one of the pallet labels with details of provenance and certification of the new slate. Location of the mine quarry, Pompeo, Brazil. A brief online search places Pompeo in Brazil's state Minas Gerais, which loosely translates as general mines. The state is dominated by extractive industries and notorious for two recent catastrophic dam collapses associated with the Vale Mining Company, one of the Paraupeba River upstream of the town of Pompeo. Through correspondence with a Brazilian colleague and translation assistance from a Portuguese friend, I learn that Pompeo lies on a dedicated slate province where the material is abundant, accessible and easily extracted. Recent investment has focused on building up international markets and Brazilian slate has become popular in the United Kingdom because it is inexpensive and remarkably uniform in quality and texture. Apparently, some Brazilian slate is classed as sedimentary mudstone rather than true metamorphic slate, which gives it different properties when worked and a tendency to absorb moisture when installed. Where does this story leave us? Somewhere between Cornwall and Brazil, between COVID-19 and climate change, stuck in a tale of two slates. I have narrated the essential details. A porch fails, nine months later its repair is complete. A simple story, really, or not, depending on how you want to cut it. On the subject of cutting, in the course of writing this piece, I learned that in a true slate, the process of metamorphosis involves the application of sustained low-grade pressure or heat, which transforms mudstone or shale deposits by realigning their mineral structure into new planes, creating a harder stone with schistose foliation. The resulting slate splits or cleaves along these new planes. If this metamorphic process does not take place, softer mudstone or shell will split along the original bedding planes, making it easier to extract but also less durable. Maybe societies are like slates, subject to unexpected impact. They break along new planes of possibility, learning from past pressures, or they reveal themselves as weak and brittle, prone to shattering. Our world at the moment is cut through this crisis, but the effects of this crisis are not being felt evenly. Climate breakdown and global contagion play out in major and minor ways, in specific places and processes, and in everyday stories about, in this case, failed maintenance, eventual collapse and incremental repair. I did not choose to purchase the Brazilian slates for the roof of my porch or the roof of the building I write this in, but I am still complicit in the act of their extraction far away in the state mines of Minas Gerais. I can choose whether to translate this complicity into indifference or into connection. To cleave can mean to split apart. Its roots in the Germanic word for cleaven, as in hooves. Or it can have an entirely opposite meaning, to adhere, to cleave one thing onto another. 
If we need to rethink our care of historic architectures to adopt an ethical stance that allows us to collaborate with natural processes, perhaps a theory of relational complicity is a corollary to this practice. In some instances, faced with the disintegration and transformation of material fabric, the most ethically sound position is to do very little and to observe the emergence of novel ecologies and other than human communities. When this is not feasible and when intervention is necessary, we need to be aware of how every choice, however apparently minor, binds us to other people and other landscapes in complex and indeliable relationships. Such relationships remain, for the most part, invisible in our maintenance of everyday architectures. A methodology oriented to the telling of incidental stories of how buildings come together and come apart is perhaps our best tool in repairing this blindness. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.